Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the first uh, episode of this limited series on how to live a good life, uh, which is a book published recently by uh, Vintage and uh, uh, for which uh, myself and uh, Dan Kaufman and Sky Cleary, who are all in this room, uh, were the co-editors. And today we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about this. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce you to our actual host, uh, Jamie Lombardi. Jamie teaches philosophy at Bergen Community College. She's the co-host of the Serious Inquiries Only podcast. And you can, that's a great title. And uh, you can find her on Twitter at uh, uh, UTFRO. I can't believe she got that handle uh, for people who have read Plato. Uh, and mostly talking about um, Albert Camus. In fact, she had an article recently in, I think, EO Magazine, was it, um, on Camus? Or was it um, IAI? Because oh. I keep forgetting those two. Uh, I, I, I owe I, Nigel a thousand apologies for not having my Camus article to him on time. <laughs> That's all right. Um, okay, take it, uh, take it off. It's, it's, it's on you now. All right, great. Um, so I guess I will introduce the three of you um, for anybody tuning in who doesn't know. And then we'll begin with some questions before opening it up to people who are here. Um, so Massimo, you are the K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. You are most recently the author of the best-selling How to Be a Stoic Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life. Um, we are also That's right. on. Yeah, <laughs> so thank you. You got uh, it. And thank you for asking me to do this. Um, we are also joined by Daniel A. Kaufman, who received his BA in philosophy at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and his PhD in philosophy at the CUNY Graduate Center. He is a philosophy professor at Missouri State University. And Sky C. Cleary is a philosopher and author of Existentialism and Romantic Love. And management at Columbia University, Barnard College, the City University of New York, and the New York Public Library. All right, so to kind of keep things in the same order, we'll start from there. Um, and we'll start talking about the book with you, Massimo. Um, okay. Can I also say, um, oh. yeah, we, I want to welcome um, Keith Goldsmith, who's the editor of this book at Vintage. So uh, thank you for joining, Keith. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, one of the things that I really liked about this collection was the way it showed how different philosophies can help us understand and live our lives. The book isn't just a series of introductions to those philosophies, though I think it does do a good job of that too. It also includes touching stories of how the different authors came to discover their own philosophies, sometimes in rather unexpected ways. I was hoping you'd share your story about how you came to Stoicism, but first, I was wondering if you could tell us how the book came to be. Actually, the book came, uh, the idea came out of an earlier dialogue, video dialogue that we did with uh, Dan and, and Sky. Um, in fact, Sky and I were the, uh, the guests, and Dan has his own show on Blogging Against TV called Sophia. And we were talking about, um, I think, I'm pretty sure we were talking about stoicism and existentialism. Uh, what else? And uh, at some point after the, the discussion, I said, you know, it would be interesting actually to, to ask a bunch of people to contribute um, essays on their own chosen and lived philosophy of life, not just, as you just pointed out, not just somebody who writes about it scholarly, from a scholarly perspective, but somebody who thinks that they they actually li are living that particular philosophy uh, or religion, because the book is also also includes a number of religions. And that's how the, the idea came, came about. Um, and then uh, Keith at, uh, at Vintage was enthusiastic about it, and uh, now we have the book. Awesome. Okay, so um, for those of us or who haven't read the book yet, how, how did someone who was a professional biologist uh, for a while find their way to stoicism? A uh, couple of reasons, a midlife crisis. Uh, that it's, you know, it's, it's, the, it's, it's one way to get back to the philosophy. Uh, but also I have to say, uh, in the reason my midlife crisis led me to philosophy is because when I was in high school in Italy, in Rome, I had a wonderful philosophy teacher for three years because in Italy you have to take three years of philosophy, it's mandatory um, in high school. And uh, she was just spectacular in terms of you know, how she made the uh, subject matter come alive. And uh, the philosophy baguette stayed in, my, in the back of my mind throughout my career as a biologist. 
and I kept reading both general philosophy and philosophy of science. And uh, at some point when the midlife crisis uh, struck, I said, oh, you know what? I could go back to graduate school and, uh, and get a PhD in philosophy and maybe, maybe switch career, which, which is what happened. Which is what you did. All right. Um, so before I move on, um, obviously, when we originally planned to do this, um, it was sort of our, our pre-plague existence. Um, <laughs> and so I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, about what Stoicism can offer us now that we're living in a sort of apocalypse. Are there any, you know, Stoic exercises, for example, that you think would be particularly helpful, um, not just in our, our regular lives, which maybe we'll return to one day, um, but right. here in this really weird, dark timeline. Yeah, a very simple and, and effective, in my mind at least, exercise is uh, based on a fundamental stoic concept, which is referred to often these days as a dichotomy of control, although that's a modern term. It's, that, that's actually not found in ancient stoic texts. The dichotomy of control comes out of a famous phrase of uh, Epictetus, who was a early second century stoic philosopher who influenced Marcus Aurelius, the emperor. Epictetus, in his handbook, or the Enchiridion, or handbook, right at the beginning says, uh, some things are up to us and other things are not up to us. And then he goes on and lists the kinds of things that are up to us and the kinds of things that are not up to us. And then he says, you know, the key to a happy life is to focus on the first, meaning on the things that you can actually um, do, and then take the rest as it comes, uh, you know, develop an attitude of equanimity. So the exercise here, um, uh, it can be applied both to, you know, plague, uh, times and, and regular and regular times and that is whenever you feel uh, that you have a, a problem or a situation it's difficult to deal with you know that could be you know being stuck at, at home in my case for this is my 41st day for instance um, or just a more normal thing like uh, you know a, a job interview for instance or something like that uh, then what you do is you draw yourself you, uh, a table with a couple of columns and on the, on the left, you put everything in that situation that you feel is under your control. And on the right, everything that you feel, feel is not entirely under your control, things that you may be able to influence, but you don't ultimately control because the outcome depends on other people or circumstances. And then once that back list is clear in your mind, you go over uh, it again and again, and you try to direct all your thoughts to the first, to the left column, and, and repeat to yourself that as far as the right column is concerned, sometimes things go your way, sometimes they don't, just just life, and you're adult, you're not a, not, you're not a child, so you understand that, and you're not going to throw a tantrum if things don't go your way. So it's, I think it's, it's a very um, helpful exercise. There are versions of it that come out of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and it helps doing th avoiding some, some common recur recurring approaches that people have, like catastrophizing. Catastrophizing means that you, know, you look at a problem and you, instead of looking at the problem as something that, that has actionable components, you immediately tell yourself, this is a catastrophe, this is the worst thing that ever, has ever happened to anybody, and that paralyzes you, depresses you, generates anxiety, and so on. Excellent. Um, thank you. Um, staying with ancient Greece, but now turning to Dan, um, I wanted to talk about his essay on Aristotelianism. Um, Dan, your essay was one of the few in the collection that left out why your chosen philosophy was so personal to you. Um, would you be willing to elaborate a little bit on what it is about Aristotelianism that improved your life or, you know, in what ways you've been able to flourish that were previously unavailable to you? Well, I don't, I don't know that it, it, I don't know that it's so much for me um, enabled me to flourish in a way that I wouldn't have been able to before, but more rather provided me with a sort of a frame or a way of understanding uh, my life that maybe that I hadn't understood before. So I, you know, the way I came to all of this, so neither of my parents um, are educated beyond the sixth grade. Um, they're, they're Holocaust survivors. So their lives were effectively interrupted. Um, and they came to the United States in the 1950s. Um, I was raised in a Jewish household, um, but a Jewish household of, of a relatively, how shall I say, um, um, very low supernatural quotient to it. Um, um, <laughs> Judaism is one of those, one of the religions that you can kind of live, live within the religious identity and still be what from other perspectives would be almost entirely secular. 
um, because um, it focuses a lot upon daily life and about fam on family and on uh, various traditions that um, that retain a lot of their significance even without um, an explicit supernatural commitment. Um, it's very much tied up with 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 a people. Um, and so a lot of the things that I think that some people perhaps look to philosophies to acquire, um, I sort of already had um, because I was raised in a, in a family with a very strong sense of, of belonging to a, to a people, um, belonging to an extended family, belonging to a, his, a particular history. Um, what, you know, so I, when I came to philosophy, I didn't come to philosophy until I was in college. And, um, you know, unlike Massimo, I did not read philosophy in high school. It really was not part of my, my experience. I only, only really started doing philosophy in college and then, uh, of course, chose it to teach philosophy as my profession. So for me, I came to, you know, a philosophy of life later and, and in a way um, for a different sort of reason. What I found about in Aristotelianism is I found it, in my view, the, the, the best and I thought the most realistic frame within which to think of one's life. And um, well, you know, I think Massimo and I might disagree as to, to how much this contributes to, to, to your successes in living your life. I do think that the capacity to reflect upon um, in the way that philosophers do, to reflect upon one's life um, does enhance and add to one's capacity to live it well. Um, but anybody who's read my chapter will know that, that, that mine is probably one of the most minimalistic in terms of um, what I take to be the contribution of the philosophy to the actual life that a person leads. Yeah, so that, that, that fits with how my reading of it too. Um, but I guess a similar question to Massimo now. We're here in these sort of weird times. Um, there's a, a pandemic. We're all sort of trapped inside with you know, on the one hand, it seems like an abundance of time to live a life of contemplation um, in a world that it seems really hard to, to sometimes sit down and focus in. Um, what are some ways that Aristotelianism could be implemented into people's lives as we sort of, you know, I, when a good life seems so far out of hand because it's a, it's a quarantined life? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, it's not, div it's not divulging too much. And of course today, this is so common as to hardly be a revelation, but you know, I also do, I, 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 I see a therapist um, regularly, um, which helps an awful lot. And now you can sort of do, you know, you can have Skype therapy now. Um, um, and so um, uh, I don't know that the philosophy by itself really, you know, aids me on a daily basis in confronting this situation we're in, in the way that uh, something like stoicism, which actually has explicit disciplines and regimens that go with it might do. Um, I will say though, that one of the things about Aristotle, and I mean, this is getting very general and would probably be true of a lot of philosophers, but it's certainly true of Aristotle, is there's just generally an emphasis on kind of, a kind of moderation that at least in one frame means to sort of just sort of chill out and be a little bit, um, take, take things into a perspective, right? So, I mean, whenever I'm sort of getting too freaked out about what's going on today and, you know, I've got a teenage daughter at home. So there's also, I'm, I'm trying to manage other people's emotions, right? Um, uh, help and manage other people's emotions. Um, you know, one of the things I really find helpful is to, is to, is to try to adopt, take perspectives, right? I think about what my parents were going through when they were my age or when they were 17 years old, um, uh, much worse. Uh, I think about what the entire generation of Americans who, who lived through the Second World War, through the Great Depression, uh, went through. I think about what, um, you know, people, you know, you know, people in, in, the, in, in Europe who may have endured years and years of severe rationing and, and other sorts of, in other words, it helps me to reflect upon what even in our recent history, we've been able to overcome. And I find that this provides me with courage. Um, this, this uh, you know, I don't, the human genome has not changed in 50 years. Um, and I really do believe that we are up to it. Um, um, and, and, and that, you know, even just talking to my parents every day reminds me of what people can overcome, right? Um, um, and so um, um, I don't know if that's directly informed by the philosophy, but there is something in Aristotle that really does sort of in, invite a person to, to sort of see things in context and in perspective and in a kind of balance. 
And actually, if uh, since you just um, mentioned this, this aspect, you're right. It is, I think, it does come with sort of a general philosophical outlook, but but it is also very specifically present in other philosophies. Um, what you just described uh, sounds like it's almost straight out of Marcus Aurelius' meditations. That's one of his regular thoughts. You know, whenever he was in trouble, he would go back to to write to him in his own diary uh, to himself, and he would say. So you think you're the first human being to go through this kind of stuff? I mean, there's plenty of others have. Yeah. And if they survived, uh, evidently they found a way to cope with it. And what, why you sh shouldn't you be able to uh, cope with it? So, yes, this, this view from above, as it's called. In yeah, space, that's right. This, I forgot the name yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 That's this notion that you want to expand both in time and geographically and realize that you're definitely not the exception, that these kind of things or worse as ha have happened to other people. And, and that is a sort of a, a source of consolation, I think, or of, of comfort. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you, Dan. Um, Sky, I want to turn to you now. Um, like Massimo, you found your way to philosophy while pursuing a very different kind of life. Um, could you tell those who are tuned in about how you found your way to philosophy and which philosophy it was you found your way to? Sure. Um, so I, yeah, kind of came, I, I'd studied some philosophy in my undergraduate degree, but it was heavily analytical and it didn't really capture me then. So I kind of gave it up and moved on to a career in finance. Um, and then sort of in my mid late twenties, I ended up doing an MBA and uh, that MBA was at Macquarie University in Australia, where they have some philosophers on faculty. Um, and so in my first semester, I was sitting in a classroom um, on organizational behavior with a professor. Uh, her name was Anne-Marie Moody. And she, her PhD was on existentialism in the boardroom and talking about freedom and responsibility and uh, rela authentic relationships. Um, and I was like, wow, what is this? <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> um, and um, it's, and uh, this kind of came about at a time in my life, you know, kind of looking at late twenties where I was feeling, you know, a lot of pressure from different directions. You know, I had friends and having like getting married and having babies and family kind of nudging me saying, you know, what are you thinking? If you want to get married, you better not wait too long. Um, and of course, looking around at pop culture, it was everywhere. I was seeing, um, you know, the dominant narrative, which is um, to, you know, find the one and fall in love and get married and have babies and live happily ever after. But I just wasn't buying it because um, it was, I guess I, I knew so many people in unhappy marriages and, you know, looking at the divorce rate, it's kind of like a flip of the coin as to whether it's successful or not. So I was just like, I'm, I'm not really sure if that's the formula for a happy life. Um, and should I even be striving for a happy life? And it was also at the time where I was having, you know, relationship uh, tensions as well and trying to balance, you know, being in a relationship with my own ambitions and thoughts about doing a PhD. Um, and so there were some arguments in my life about that. Um, and I was uh, kind of so I didn't have a philosophy of life at that time. And I was kind of swimming in ambiguity around all these questions. Um, and so, and also at that time, a book came out called Tete a Tete by Hazel Rowley, which talked specifically about Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, which were two of the most famous existential philosophers of all. Um, and so, yeah, I really just got hooked on existentialism then. And not that they had the answers because they did but uh, a bit like Dan was saying, it provides a framework with which to kind of think through a lot of the challenges and issues in life, especially regarding um, being an individual, but being, you know, in a society and having relationships. Um, and so, yeah, I guess I worked out that, you know, the path to a good life isn't necessarily the romantic ideal, but what I liked about existential philosophy in particular was that it focused very much on um, thinking about pursuing authentically meaningful, you know, self-chosen projects. Um, and also creating relationships on our own terms and kind of, you know, forgetting that, that typical romantic narrative and figuring out what actually works for, for the people in the relationship, as long as it's adult and consenting. That's awesome. So um, I do have other questions too, but I also want to ask you, right? Because I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm sort of like overwhelmed by plague. 
Um, and so um, I loved your, your, you had an article on partying like an existentialist and you talked about how the existentialist would sort of ration their food coupons together during, you know, the darkest days of World War II so that they could find some joy amidst all of the terror that they were living in. And so, um, you know, as, as Dan had alluded to, if people were able to get through World War II, um, obviously we should be able to get through hanging out on our couch watching Netflix. Um, but what are some existentialists? I don't know. That's hard. That's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. But so what are some existentialist um, insights that we could maybe adopt during this time um, to get through quarantine life so that we can go on afterward, hopefully, and, and live a good life? Yeah, so as you mentioned in the article, yeah, certainly partying with friends, even if it's virtually, like that's, no, but really being connected with friends is like super important from, you know, a mental health perspective. Um, and, but I think the existential philosophers were focused, yes, on, they, they love to have a good time, but they also were keenly aware of um, being in society and um, a responsibility to, to be engaged in social activism. And the principle that underpins their philosophy about that is the idea of freedom. And you know, we should be fighting for freedom um, to open up futures for everyone to choose and pursue their authentically meaningful projects. Um, and so that's why they were fighting in the resistance um, specifically. Um, but, you know, we all need a break <laughs> from, from um, fighting those sorts of battles. Um, and yeah, and I think one of the main things I've been taking away during this time um, of you know, COVID-19 is our um, interconnectedness. Now, I want to be careful about using that because there's talk about everybody being in the same boat and people saying, well, no, because it affects so many people differently. And I mean, I think that we are becoming keenly aware of our interdependence and we certainly are interconnected, but, you know, the, the, um, the effects of coronavirus is having such vastly different um, impact on different people um, because of the situation in society. Um, and, you know, Simone de Beauvoir said that, um, you know, the world is, you know, flooded with um, human actions and other people's, um, you know, trying to impose their meaning on the world. And, you know, each one of us is a fact of the other's existence. Um, and so she argues that we're um, responsible for one another by virtue of our coexistence. And she describes it like... Um, society like stones in an arch, you know, individuals are like stones in an arch. And so the health of the arch or the health of society depends on the health of everybody in that society. Um, and, you know, it is really hard to find a basis on which to connect with other people, but we certainly face the same human condition together and we face the same, you know, virus and face the same, well, people are in more risk than others um, because of their situation. But, um, I think her point is that relationships are always in conflict, but in order to keep that healthy arch, um, the main principle that should guide our actions is generosity. Um, and, you know, she says, well, okay, well, the question is, well, how do you be generous in a world like today? And I mean, there's the obvious things like um, donating, um, you know, tipping people well, um, and, you know, volunteering services wherever you can. Um, but how do you know whether that's going to help or not is a completely different question. And Simone de Beauvoir points out that, you know, actions always do take place in the midst of, you know, uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, and, you know, maybe we will end up failing to help in any meaningful way, but, you know, failure is an act of life. We risk failure in anything we do, and that's not an excuse to escape responsibility for our actions. So, you know, we kind of have to leap in and act anyway. And I mean, think about the, the coronavirus, like the, the most we can do, um, to, or the least we can do is just staying home. I mean, it's really not um, a big deal to, um, for a lot of people just to stay out of the way of other people. Like that is actually a generous act. But of course, if there's more to be done, then I, I think, um, you know, I'm kind of looking for different ways and I've been volunteering and donating. So I think that kind of existential philosophy has helped me kind of think through, you know, what to do in that situation. Um, well, thank you for that answer. Cause um, 
not only was that excellent, it also set up a perfect bridge um, to the next question that I have for you guys. Um, and I guess you can answer this in um, whoever sort of wants to answer first. Um, and so even though each one of you have chosen a different personal philosophy, one theme that was common throughout almost all of the essays and, and your three as well um, was, the important, uh, was the importance of our relationship to others. Um, in order to cultivate ourselves, it seems we're dependent on others. Um, could you elaborate on this a bit more, how it ties into having a good life, um, and maybe a bit about why the philosophy you've chosen helps us understand this, this question in a, in a better way? Yeah, so the, the, the Stoics have very specific answers to those questions. Um, they believe in uh, a universal, you know, cosmic web of cause and effect. Uh, that had no exception. In other words, they were actually determinists from a metaphysical perspective. Like that. Um, that would be the modern terminology. And um, that means that we are literally interconnected, right? That, that everything we do is, is connected to, to everything else. Yes, as Sky was saying, uh, there are different degrees of effects and reverberations of those effects. And, and sure enough, Chrysippus, who was one of the early Stoics, who was um, a major logician, actually did a, a whole study of you know, different aspects of causality and different degrees of causality. So, but the number, the, the fact of the world, according to the Stoics, is that we are interconnected. Another fact of the world is that our species is intrinsically social, right? So today we would say we are, we evolved as social animals. And uh, it is a fundamental aspect of what it means to be human. Uh, human beings just don't do well in isolation. They don't do well outside of a social network. Of, of some sort. Um, the Stoics also thought that another fundamental aspect of human nature, you know, in a sense, is the fact that we are capable of reason, which is obviously the case at a far higher degree than any other species on earth. They put together all these things, their knowledge, their, their understanding of the fact that the world is uh, ca causally interconnected, their understanding that the fundamentals of human nature are uh, use sociality and uh, the ability to reason, and concluded that therefore, a good human life is one in which we apply reason to improve human society. And improving human society means not only taking care of other people and um, you know, make sure that we live in a fair and, and just uh, society, but also have heavy interconnections. They were big on friendship. They were big on uh, you know, being connected to people in a, in a meaningful, uh, deep way. So that's, that's the way they, they would approach it. Awesome. Should I go next? That'd be great. Um, so I'm going to answer from, from broadly two dimensions. I mean, the, the, a lot of what Massimo said, I, I obviously agree with the thing, of, especially the point about us being social animals. Um, of course, that doesn't mean any, everyone. There are some people who are sort of, you know, hermits and, and all of that. But, you know, we're talking about the overwhelming majority of people. Um, and that serves as probably a foundation for what I'm about to say. Um, but from my standpoint, and this also does really fit quite in uh, with an Aristotelian outlook. One thing for the Aristotelian um, to fl flourishing eudaimonia consists ultimately of uh, fulfilling one's life, one's project, one's life's project, right? Um, and um, our the our greatest life's projects are things that can only be done in collaboration. Um, um, you know, if you think about all the greatest human endeavors, there are very few that are solitary um, and that, or that are accomplished in a solitary fashion. I mean, even, the, you know, your greatest geniuses, your Einsteins, your, you know, the, these, are, these are accomplishments that are done involving many others. Um, and so for one thing, I, you know, our greatest, our greatest um, uh, 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 projects are, are going to be collaborative projects and um and and thus um we're 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 only going to really flourish in my view um uh in connection with others um the other side of it i mean this is obviously related but um um i don't think that one can ever fulfill one's own personal individual characterological if you want to call it um um uh potential other than in relationship with others. 
um, and I'll say this in a way that's probably very, uh, you know, commonsensical. And I mean, you know, people will understand this right away, even if they're not in this position, they'll understand what I mean. Um, I, I, to the extent to which, and I'm not going to say this about myself, others will say it, to the extent to which I really, you know, develop and become an admirable person in the course of my life, um, um, will have a lot to do with how I parented my daughter will have a lot to do on the, with the kind of husband I was. In other words, we'll have to do with things that can only arise within the context of not just relationships, but, but profound and intimate relationships. Um, and so I don't believe that I could have become the person I've become, if hopefully that's a good thing, without the relationships that, that, uh, that, that, that form my life. And I don't believe that we in general um, can really um, uh, uh, accomplish our greatest projects other than in, in concert with one another. Um, and that's, that's how I would answer, want to answer the question. Okay, uh, Sky? Sure, I think I partially answered it in my uh, previous question, but I'll add to that that, you know, and that, that's one of the principles underpinning the book that, um, you know, the book is based on the idea that if you have some idea of how the world works, so a metaphysics, and have a sense of how to behave properly with others, um, which is an ethics, then you kind of have a philosophy of life, even if you don't really think about it or haven't really introspected. Um, and one of the most important um, contributions that I think existentialism makes to this is that, you know, we can go around um, kind of introspecting um, or looking in the mirror, but that only tells us so much about ourselves. Um, and Jean Paul Sartre pointed out that, you know, we actually need other people um, because they hold an aspect of our being that we can't understand without them. Um, so he actually said, even, even though other people are hell. Other people, that's exactly <laughs> right. Other people are hell. Yeah. Right. Um, because, yeah, we always want to, um, you know, because he argues that, you know, um, the goal of life is to have, you know, full knowledge of ourselves. Um, but we can't get that without other people's opinion. But it's also depends on the views that we have of the other person. Like if we don't care about the other person, then, you know, we shouldn't care about their views. But if we're, say, if we love the other person, then, of course, we're going to care more about what they think of us and that's hell because the more we care about them the more we want to control their views of us um, and this is what fuels the kind of sadomasochism in relationships that uh, Jean-Paul Sartre talks about um, but the point is that um, you know sometimes the existentialists are um, kind of accused of being individualistic but I think I think that's uh, wrong um, because they very much acknowledge that we are thrown into webs of relationships. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're responsible for other people by virtue of our coexistence. Um, and so the best way to um, interact with other people is to strive for um, authentically meaningful relationships, which means that um, we respect one another's freedom. Um, we um, avoid being possessive or dominating or jealous. Um, we support one another. Um, and in flourishing, I mean, they didn't necessarily use the word flourishing, but it's similar to what Massimo and Dan were talking about in the um, eudaimonia. Um, and, you know, figuring out goals together. And the best kind of relationships, authentic relationships, are ones that inspire us to be better people, but not just towards one another, but to be better people in the world. Um, and so I think one of the key things is underpinning all great relationships is an idea of, you know, being great friends. Um, and so it means supporting each other and um, uh, pushing each other, but it doesn't mean necessarily being tolerant of one another. And Nietzsche has a great quote on this. And he says, um, you know, let your pity for your friend um, uh, hide itself under a hard shell and you should break your tooth biting upon it. And thus it will have <laughs> delicacy and sweetness. Um, so, I mean, that's a bit harsh, but I think I really like the point he's trying to get at, which I think is that great friends, um, you know, support one another and supporting one another also means being constructively critical and, and challenging each other. So, I mean, I think ideally we're striving for a form of great friendship in, in, in our relationships. 
So, I mean, can I, if I could add something, I just want to, to what this guy just said um, about the hell is other people, um, which of course, for those who don't know, comes from Sartre's play, No Exit, um, which if you haven't read it is an absolutely incredible read and I strongly recommend it. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of guys, are, I think absolutely correct. I mean, a lot of people mistakenly think that, well, if hell is other people, then by implication, heaven is no people. Um, <laughs> and I would say that that's a complete misunderstanding of it. Um, if hell is other people, then heaven is also other people, right? Um, um, the, the issue is to point up, is to center the significance of relationships, not to, not to imply something misanthropic. I just wanted to add that because... Yeah. I think that's yeah. absolutely right. And that's an important point to not misread some of these things, which have very powerful slogans attached to them. Yeah. And so um, with that, um, I would like to sort of open it up to questions for people who are part who, who are joining us today, because um, I see that we are running a little bit low on time. Um, so if anybody is here who would like to ask a question, if you click the raise hand button, don't like raise your hand because I won't be able right. to see it. Um, we, I have, will... we have one, uh, Craig. Uh, now, let me see if I can uh, okay. unmute Craig. I mean, I know I can. There's also the one uh, in the chat box. There is also one in the chat box. Yeah, we'll get there okay, I see. in a minute. Um, I see. But um, there it is. Um, okay. You know, and while we're um, waiting, it just it wouldn't be right, I feel, to say if you Craig. feel inclined to read plays by existentialists of the, the 1940s. There's always Camus if you're not feeling big on Satra. <laughs> Which right. would be my recommendation. So, um, so I just finished the book actually today. Um, but is the idea I get from this is the main takeaway we should get from this book is not necessarily, although each of you per, have, are a proponent of your own particular life philosophy is not to necessarily that we adopt a particular life philosophy, but that we adopt a life philosophy, philosophy at all, right? And that we examine ourselves under whatever particular um, life philosophy we choose to adopt, which may be an individual one is highlighted in the chapters, or it could be a combination of them, because one of the things that I noticed actually is the great number of similarities between the different philosophy as well as the differences. So yeah. that was yeah. my, thank you. No, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, that's, that's exactly right. The, the notion is that everybody, I think Ben, ben mentioned this earlier, everybody actually has a philosophy of life, or maybe with Sky. Um, and whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, um, in fact, most of us take that philosophy of life straight from whatever religion we, we grew up with. Um, because a religion, we argue in the book, is also a philosophy of life because it has the two components that Sky was mentioning earlier. It has a metaphysics, an account of how the world works, and it has an ethics, an account of how you should live in the world. Some religions even have uh, a practice, a set of practices, right? In fact, most of them do. If, if, if you count, uh, you know, reading scriptures and, and um, going to meetings with other people to exchange, you know, to support each other, as well as, you know, praying or, or meditating if you're a Buddhist or something like that, then those are all practices. So we all have a philosophy of life. The point of the book is to say, maybe, maybe you want to think about the one you have more or less implicitly adopted and see if that actually still fits you or whether there is something that uh, resonates better with you. And yes, they can also be combinations. I mean, after all, almost every philosophy of life started out as a, com as a combination of something else. Uh, Zeno of Sadium was the, the um, originator of Stoicism and Zeno studied with a number in, in around 300 BC in Athens. He studied with a number of other philosophers beginning with uh, a cynic and then he went on to start in, with in Plato's Academy and so on and so forth. And then in the initial version of Stoicism was actually a syncretism of a number of these positions. Uh, then what happens is, however, one of the advantages of, you know, looking at philosophies that have been around for a while, for a while is that then the initial syncretism gets, uh, you know, pared down and, and the degree of internal coherence increases. I mentioned Chrysippus early on. Chrysippus was the third head of the Stoa, and he's the one that is often credited for the version of Stoicism that we know today, because that's exactly what he did. He, he uh, built on Zeno's system, but also mostly purged other things or, or, or rearranged things so that Stoicism would make sense in, internally. Um, then, uh, uh, Sky, any, any comment on that one uh, before we go on to the next question? Uh, no, I mean, I, I was just, you know, 
uh, the way I think of it is you either have an implicit philosophy of life or you have an explicit one. Um, you know, um, all human beings are, are by nature to some degree reflective um, um, and to some degree, uh, uh, con- you know, actively on an ongoing basis in consideration of their activity and their, their beliefs and so on and so forth. So, you know, a, a philosophy is essentially implicit in reflective life and all of us to some degree are reflective. Um, the difference is, in, in, you know, in, in these sorts of books and chapters is, 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 is the rendering it explicit, right? Um, and in many cases, what happens is that to the extent to which one chooses an explicit philosophy of life, it's the one that resonates most with the one that was already implicit, right? And that, that's, that would be in my case, how that happened with me, right? I mean, I, I, I already had a pretty robust philosophy of life that was very much implicit in the way I lived and the way I conducted my relations. And Aristotle simply was the philosophy, the explicit philosophy that I found, that I saw that seemed to most fit with it. Um, that's how at least I tend to think of it. Yeah, and I'll just add that, um, you know, one of the goals of the book was to help people to reflect yeah, on their philosophy of life and also whether it's a good philosophy of life um, because they're not all good ones. And um, But we have found them and all the contributors to the book have found um, their philosophies of life to be helpful um, and ins- inspire changes um, for the better in their lives. Okay, next we have Stephen. Stephen. Uh, you can, uh, I'm going to mute, unmute your audio so you can go ahead and ask the question. Uh, maybe I'm going to unmute your audio. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, I'm to unmute it now. Um, I, first of all, before, I'm going to be a little bit negative, but I'd like to say, first of all, I found it a very interesting book. And you'll be glad to know as authors that I've uh, persuaded at least 11 other people in uh, England to buy the book as well. So uh, I'm not entirely negative about it. But I did feel the subtitle was a bit misleading, A Guide to Choosing Your Personal Philosophy, because it seemed to me what you did is you offered 15 alternatives, but there wasn't much guidance (laughs) on which one of these 15 you should choose. So mm-hmm. you say in the introduction, uh, well, you should be able to defend what you what you're doing, but you don't say how you defend it. I did uh, the I, I did jump through to the end of the conclusion, and there seemed to be one or two points there that I wondered how important you thought they were. You said uh, some people are looking for an interest in morality, some are looking for self-discipline. Some are looking for human connectedness. Some are looking for healthy, pleasurable experience. And others are looking to live with and embrace radical freedom. Actually, five pretty different criteria, which may be a conflicting. Um, So other than it fitted in with how you already felt, which I think was uh, what uh, Daniel was just saying, how does one choose between these many alternatives? And of course, there are lots more isms that we could have chosen. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thank you. Awesome. Guys, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll, 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 keep the same order, or, or sure, I'll, I can I can give yeah. it the, the the first the first crack. Yeah, that probably generates less um, talking over each other. I guess. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I think at some point, actually, we were tempted to sort of be a little bit more specific, especially in the conclusion about, you know, how to go about it. But then again, at the same time, it felt like it's not our our job to really tell people what philosophy to endorse or not to endorse. Um, and so that's why the chapters are descriptive and there is no sort of taxonomic key. That they're going to say, well, if you're if you feel this way, then you should go to Buddhism or something like that. In part because um, a lot of the philosophies actually do, when, especially when it comes to the ethics, they do converge on fairly similar, not identical, but fairly similar uh, conclusions. Like, for instance, I was struck by the many, many similarities between Buddhism and Stoicism when it comes to ethics. Their metaphysics are completely different, uh, but their, their ethics are, are very, very much convergent. And even with historical rivals of Stoicism, such as Epicureanism, there is a lot in common. There are some differences. And then I think what one might want to do is to read through the chapters and 
perhaps if you want to go about it systematically, keep track of the kinds of things you do that strike you as reasonable and the kind of things that strike you as unreasonable. Then go to the end of it and say, to the end of the, by the end of the reading, say, okay, so these things that strike me as unreasonable, uh, are they really unreasonable? So may, do some kind of sort of self-analysis essentially. Uh, and then gravitate toward a subset of philosophies that seem to resonate better with 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 you. Um, as I said, in my case, for instance, Buddhism resonated uh, fairly fairly closely, um, even though I consider myself, you know, a, stoic, a, a practitioner of Stoicism. And in fact, I dis I'm not the only one because I know a number of people um, who are both Buddhist practitioners and, and Stoic practitioners. So, so there are things that resonate. And as long as, you know, after all, it is a personal choice. So the only criterion here is that the only criteria should be that, A, the philosophy in question resonates with you. You find it, uh, you find it useful. And B, that it is a good philosophy of life, meaning that, you know, it, it, it doesn't teach you to you know, destroy the rest of humanity or, 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 you know, destroy the environment or anything like that. So, so long as it is a positive, constructive philosophy, then, then I really don't think um, it's up to other people to tell you basically what, what to, uh, what to uh, approach and what not to approach. Dan, do you want to? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll say a few things. Um, first of all, um, you know, <sighs> be aware of subtitles. That's the first thing I would say. Um, um, <laughs> and understand, well, no, there's a, there's a non-joke part to understand that to a certain extent, um, this sort of thing is done in collaboration with the press. And so, you know, I can't tell you how many books I've read where I've asked the author, you know, why is this subtitle? And he's like, I didn't put it there. The, the, the publisher wanted it. I'm not saying that that's true in our case. I'm just saying, understand that those sorts of things are not always um, are often done by a committee, so to speak. Um, um, secondly, let me just say um, that while I know the book may come off this way, it was not intended to be, and I don't think is a form of a form of self help literature, um, um, which is much more instructive to the reader. You know, right? You know, you pick up a Tony Robbins book and he's telling you how to live well. That means that that, that assumes his valuations, that assumes his conception of the good, that assumes his, and he's telling you that you should adopt it, right? That was never our, 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 our intention or, our, or, or, or what we were trying to do. Um, I viewed the book very much as a follow-up to Massimo's own. Uh, so Massimo, Massimo did this book on Stoicism, which, which uh, really, as far as I'm concerned, has had a, a remarkable effect. I, 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 if you would ask me if I could have thought a, a, a relatively esoteric philosophy you know, could, could, could have this kind of resonance and impact in the contemporary world, I would have said no. Uh, I think it's a remarkable accomplishment. Um, and I, I view this as a natural extension of what he did. Um, and because Massimo is ecumenical by nature and because he understands the complexities of life and how different people are, it would never even occur to him to try to prescribe a stoicism to everyone. He, he adds a disclaimer to every conversation he ever has that this, uh, that this works for him and he can tell you why, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work for you. Last thing, let me say, um, at, at the risk of being long winded, um, um, the way I look at this, certainly there are certain elements of some of the philosophy that may contradict one another. Um, the way I looked at, at the book in terms of providing a service to people as opposed to simply just being of interest was that, like, as I said, I do believe that everyone implicitly does have some sort of philosophy of life. I do think that one of the benefits of studying formal philosophy is um, to help bring a more explicit frame to the understanding of one's life. But I don't think that that explicit frame that you can bring can be so at odds with the implicit one that, that it, in a sense it replaces it. I don't think that that ever works. In other words, the explicit philosophy has to suit the person. Um, and I think probably if you looked at the different philosophies of life that are espoused by the authors of this book, and if you, if you got to partake in their life a little bit for a little while, you'd see right away why they chose it. And indeed, if you looked at Aristotelianism, Stoicism, and, and Existentialism, you could, pro and you knew Sky Massimo and I, you probably could see right away, right? <laughs> 
why yeah. this guy is this one and she's that one. And, and so um, I don't know that I feel that that's contradictory. I think it's more a matter of um, the varieties of human nature and of individual lives and the necessity that an explicit philosophy must to a certain extent suit the kind of person one already is. That, that's sort of the way I would answer it. It's kind. Yeah, I mean, I would just add briefly that, I mean, human life is so complex and nuanced um, and our situations are all so different that there isn't one size fits all. And thank goodness, you know, we're philosophers, we're not gurus, we're not dictators. And from an existential perspective, yet yeah, we're condemned to choose and that's um, going to create anxiety. But mm. I think the way I see it is we're kind of pointing the way for other people saying, look, this is what worked for us. This is what we like about what um, our philosophies of life. Um, and as someone said before, there are many similarities across the different philosophies because they are all sort of heading in in similar directions you know how to be with other people um, but there are lots of different answers to, to those questions so it's um yeah and one of the main points of the book is just to appreciate the sheer variety of philosophies that are out there um and you know i'd love to do a, another version with uh, another 15 but that's a conversation for another time I, I we have want, about sorry, sorry go ahead i just wanted to say um um to not uh, forget that there are also questions that are being posed in the chat that are not coming from the raised hands. That's all that I wanted to say. Yeah, uh, that's true. Uh, we might get to those or, or not. Okay. <laughs> we only have about 10 minutes yeah, sure. uh, left. And um, so I think we're time basic big for, for a couple of questions. Maybe we can take another live one and then the first one or second one on the, on the chat. And then we need to kind of, kind of wrap it up. So next up is actually Derek. And again, I'm going to try to unmute you. Yes, Derek. Hey, I hope you guys can hear me. Uh, yes. Thanks for doing this. This is very exciting. Uh, so I teach uh, philosophy at the high school level, and uh, actually oh, next. Oh, good, week, excellent. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so next week uh, we have four weeks in the term left, and we're actually using this book for the next four weeks. Thank you. Uh, so Same thanks. This is a bit of a practical question, so I hope it doesn't bore everyone, but. Uh, how, how would you want teenagers to engage, like especially, you know, especially applicable with teenagers uh, to engage with, with the contents and ideas uh, in this, in this text? Like how, like, is there yeah. something, is there an angle, you know, that is uh, especially applicable or, or interesting for, for teenagers to, to attack? Uh, that is an excellent question. And, um, Let's say, I, I think that, so I taught occasionally philosophy at a pre-college level, usually on a voluntary basis. And the thing that works um, well for me is, is really some, some kind of age-appropriate Socratic dialogue. You don't want to lecture uh, to those kids. Uh, you, prob you probably shouldn't lecture in college either. But, you know, if you have 60 people in the room, that's, there's probably not much of, a, of a, a, other possibilities. But especially in, in, uh, in high school or, you know, pre-college, um, it's great if you can get them to do at least some of the readings, of course, um, but, um, but at the very least, you, you could sketch the, the basic outline of, of each philosophy one, one at a time and then put them into a practical situation. So ask them, you know, what was the last time that you had a challenging situation? What was the last time that you have a, a problem that you felt uh, was overwhelming or difficult to approach or something like that? And then let's work through how would this particular philosophy approach it how would um what, what would you get out of existentialism in, in this particular frame or out of stoicism in this particular frame it might of course that requires a little bit of you know uh thought of on your part on, on how to guide that kind of discussion uh so that might not be practical right at the end of the semester but but that's the way i would do it um but i'm curious to hear to hear uh, dan and, and sky if they have thought about this well so i'm just now um reaching the end of the uh the task of raising a child to adulthood. My daughter just turned 18 a few weeks, a week ago and, um, and is graduating high school. Um, and so the adolescent, uh, the adolescent temperament, let's just say is very forward in my mind right now. Um, and um, you know, 
there are certain things about adolescents that I think naturally point them towards philosophy. And then there's other things about them that, that makes philosophy very difficult, right? Um, what naturally points them towards it is the kind of, a kind of uh, a natural energy um, um, an intensity of commitment and interest, right? Um, what some makes it difficult is that they tend to be very ideological and very self-righteous, right? Uh, and so, um, you know, a book like this, one of the things I think it could, you know, if you can get the teenagers to engage with it and, and not having been trained in, in pedagogy, uh, you know, college instructors famously, you know, we don't have classroom management issues. We don't, we're not trained in pedagogy, whereas high school teachers are, my wife is a high school teacher. So I, can't, I couldn't even begin to tell you how to get teenagers to, in, to, to read sort of this sort of material. But what I can say is what I think the benefit of it would be. Um, and I do think that the remarkable array of viewpoints here, many of which have ancient roots, right, um, provides an awesome opportunity to at least begin to help a, a teenager out of their ideological rigidity. That is to be able to see, wow, there are actually a lot of different ways of thinking about one's life, one's relationships and one's activities. And gosh, they all really have a lot of credibility and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, 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 weight behind them. Um, and so in other words, I see it, I, I think the book is one of the most remarkable things about it is it's, it's, is it's, is it's variety. Um, and, and, the, and, and the credibility of each of the, you know, there's no, none of these are flaky one-off sort of, you know, uh, forms of life. I mean, these are all very um, uh, deeply uh, rooted uh, and, and, and sophisticated in nature. And um, I, I've seen with my own daughter, now that she's coming out of the, the adolescent fog, um, I'm seeing more and more in her a kind of softening of her rigidity. And a lot of it does have to do with exposure to alternate points of view. And because the book is not academically written, I think it's accessible to teenagers who are willing to do the work and who are, and who are open-minded. So uh, th that's what I would say I think the main benefit of it would be. Yeah. Um... So I would say, you know, I want to highlight that a lot of people that I know, I mean, I, I do revolve in existential circles, but a lot of people do say they come to philosophy through existentialism, although I don't know if that's true. I mean, I know stoicism is super popular at the moment, but certainly there's something about existentialism with, you know, it's focused on, you know, angst and freedom and responsibility um, and questioning authority that um, seems to appeal to, to teenagers. Um, you know, I have a 10 year old, um, and, uh, you know, I kind of bring in some existentialism, but, you know, the practical parts of stoicism as well. Um, although he did tell me not so long ago that um, his philosophy of life is now pastafarianism, which is the worship of the flying spaghetti monster. Um, <laughs> you can't go wrong with spaghetti. You, know? <laughs> you would say that. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So yes, Scott, uh, you know, existentialism, yeah. the, you know, the one th thing that you would encounter in high school, right, unless you went to a very extraordinary one, would be existentialist literature. I certainly, um, you know, I read, I read, you know, Notes from Underground. Um, um, we read The Stranger uh, in high school, uh, in high school. So um, certainly I think maybe Sky's chapter might be a good first to have the students, high school students read that one first, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, guys, uh, first of all, apologies to Jimmy for having taken over basically moderation, but it's only because of technical issues that I'm the one that is actually controlling the chat and checking who's raising hands and all that sort of stuff. So my apologies. However, would, uh, Jamie, are you able to read the first question in the chat? Are you available to read the chat, the one uh, that yeah. starts on reason? The first question that popped up in the chat? Yeah, the one that, that, says, uh, that starts with on reason. It's from Simon. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so, um, Simon is asking us about Jonathan Haidt, um, and he says, Haidt might argue that reason is the rider on the elephant, merely there to rubber stamp the decisions that our biology makes. So reason alone is not enough. 
question mark. Right. Yeah, so, uh, and that's, I think what we're going to close on that question, actually, because we're basically running out of time. So I'll, I'll start, as, as usual, my thoughts, and then I want to, I'd like to hear what uh, Dan and um, Sky might have to say. So Jonathan Haidt is a social psychologist, uh, and he's famous for this, precisely the kind of research that uh, Simon is talking about. Okay, so the easy swipe here is, uh, um, you know, the question itself says Jonathan Haidt might argue that reason, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, Jonathan Haidt is deploying reason in order to convince other people that his research is valid uh, and so on and so forth. So there it is, a situation where apparently Haidt is sort of engaging in a little bit of a self-contradiction. Of course, if Haidt means, um, and I, I know Jonathan, we talked about, about this thing a number of times in, in, the, in the past. If Haidt means that reason is not the only, you know, the, the beginning and the end of human experience, that's obviously true. Uh, and no, no philosophy that we describe in the book, including Stoicism, for all its emphasis on reason, would ever argue that. In fact, the Stoics were kind of, um, um, you know, uh, a proponent of a uh, one thing, one model, one, one unity uh, model of the mind. They didn't make this sharp distinction at all between reason and emotions. In fact, they argued that the, re the, the, the reason, so to speak, uh, while why you can negotiate back and forth between your reason and emotions precisely because they're highly integrated, right? And that model actually does, uh, is, um, you know, that was the intuitive model in the Stoics had. And it does go well with uh, findings in modern cognitive science. It That's scientifically out, confirmed, actually, I believe. Right, exactly. <laughs> it goes with modern science, meaning that, yes, it is true that our emotional responses are come, you know, originate more often than not from the amygdala, which is the base of the brain. It is also true that the executive decision-making ability and logical reasoning abilities of the human brain are, are located in the anatomically in the frontal parietal lobes. But it's also a discovery of modern neuroscience that those regions are massively interconnected by literally, literally hundreds of millions of neurons that talk back and forth. And the Stoics would not be surprised. That's, well, that's why you can, you can actually modulate, modulate uh, the, the two in, in some sense. So no, definitely reason is not enough, meaning that you wouldn't want, I mean, the, if a human being were reduced to just reasoning and in particular instrumental reasoning uh, with no emotional responses, no affective responses, you essentially, you're just describing a psychopath. So um, that's probably not what you want as a, as a philosophy of life. But at the same time, I don't buy this notion of reason being just the rider on the, on the elephant and the elephant goes out anywhere, because that seems to me to deny a fundamental aspect of human nature, which is precisely the ability that we are capable of explicitly reason about things. I mean, look at the kind of stuff that we've been able to do by explicit reasoning. We're in the middle of a plague that is affecting literally the entire planet. And here it is, 70 people in these virtual room that doesn't exist anywhere, if not in, on the internet. And what do you think have made that possible? Uh, certainly your frontal part the lobes, not, not, you know, you know, not your, your basic uh, emotional responses. So that's my take on it. Uh, then. All right. So um, uh, I should say, I quite, I quite like Jonathan Haidt's work, uh, especially the stuff uh, that he's been doing recently on uh, the so-called uh, coddling of the American mind stuff. I thought it was kind of very, very interesting. Um, uh, but let me just say something here. I mean, I can agree with him without seeing it as an objection to a certain degree, right? So, um, look, Aristotle, and I, I talk about this quite a bit in my essay. Um, Aristotle himself says that with respect to the living of a good life, reason only gets you so far, and it doesn't get you that far. It gets you a very gen to a very general point, right? Um, you know, Aristotle famously preaches moderation, you know, which means reason can get you to the point to which you understand that um, you shouldn't do too much, you shouldn't do too little, but you should do the right amount. The problem is that reason only is partly helpful in getting you, uh, telling you what the right amount is, right? Um, um, and um, um, that's why Aristotle says, in addition to reason, there has to be habit, um, which is a kind of, uh, which is in, within the province of the emotions. It's a result of a conditioning of the emotions. Um, and also Aristotle thinks it has to come uh, from perception, uh, from the capacity to sort of, to a certain extent, see uh, what's 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 moderate or reasonable in a particular set of circumstances? You know, reason is in the domain of the general, not of the particular. Re reason in the realm of the particular has very a relatively limited utility. So I don't know that that what Haidt is saying is is an objection uh, to what we're doing. Now I 
do think, and I think that probably this is a, a much of what Haidt is responding to, there is a strain in the history of philosophy, especially in the modern period, I'm talking about the period from Descartes to Kant, in which I do think that reason was wildly overestimated in the way that Haidt uh, uh, thinks is, is reflecting here. And that is reflected in some of the modern moral philosophies. Um, okay. Certainly, I think some, you know, a, a, a philosophy like Kant's needs to be sort of reminded of the point that Haidt makes, right? Um, and so I think he's not really talking to the kinds of more classical traditions that certainly Massimo and I are challenging, but even the tradition that, that, that Sky is challenging, even though it's modern, it's, it's, it's not rationalistic um, in the sense that, 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 that is uh, deforming in the, in the way that Haidt points out. So I think, I think you can agree with the underlying point that he's making, but I don't think that that uh, undermines the, the sorts of uh, approaches that we're, uh, that we're pursuing in the book. Sky, you have yeah. the last word. Um, okay, that's a lot of pressure. Um, <laughs> Make it good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, I mean, the existential, um, existential philosophy was kind of created in reaction to the Enlightenment, which very much emphasized um, reason and science and... Um, uh, empirical evidence um, and the well, the romantics and then the existentialists said, well, what about passion? What about the emotions? What about nature? Um, and so we're still kind of um, dealing with this free will versus determinism question. Um, and the existentialists would kind of split it out into what they called facticity or and transcendence. So facticity is the facts of our lives. You know, it's what we're born with um, and it's the situation we're in. But transcendence is what we do to overcome the facts of um, our life and our situation and that stretching ourselves into an open future. And, you know, what we do with that and and also um, what transcendence involves is kind of, you know, taming or controlling our animal nature. So it's not leaving it behind entirely because they still love to enjoy themselves and party and, and you know, indulge in the passions, but in concert with reason. All right. Um, that essentially brings us to the end. Jamie, uh, concluding remarks before I tell people where they're going to find us next. Um, yeah, actually, you know what? I'm going to bring this up because it was raised with um, one of the people who asked a question in terms of using this book to teach. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that I had actually used excerpts from this um, this past semester into, in my introductory to philosophy courses. Um, and the reception was really overwhelmingly positive and it provided an introduction that that gave students a little bit of a background and sort of like the academic aspects of it um, but they were able to engage with it more meaningfully I thought precisely because of the way the personal narratives um, enabled them to see how these connects to real lives um, in a way that allowed them to sort of internalize they could do the same so if anybody's tuned in considering it um, from my experience it went really really well very positive great Thank you. Okay, guys, we are out of time. Thanks, everybody, for, for coming. Thanks, Jenny, for moderating uh, this, this uh, uh, discussion. Thanks, Dan and, and Sky, for joining us, the co-editors of the book, How to Live a Good Life, published by Vintage. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is actually a uh, limited, it's not, it's not open-ended, but it's a limited uh, ongoing series. This was the first episode. The second episode is already scheduled for next Saturday, May 2nd, at the same time five o'clock um, Eastern, and uh, it will feature a discussion of Buddhism and Hinduism, and we're going to have as guests the two contributors who wrote those chapters, uh, respectively, Owen Flanagan and Deepak Sarma. If you're interested in RSVPing for that one and signing up for that one, you can go to meetup.com and then look for New York Philosophy Book Club, and uh, you'll find the event. So again, thanks very much, and stay safe.